She goes down on him. Feels like he got a monster down there. <laughs> As he does. He <laughs> doesn't know how right she is. Hello and welcome to another edition of Frightfully Forgotten Horror Movies and today we have another Patreon request. Today we're tackling 1988's Brain Damage requested by Christine Irene Feduk. Before we get started, what are we drinking? Well, I'm drinking uh, Still Fire in the Sky Rye, baby! And I'm drinking store-bought beer because... Damn. I can't brew anymore. <laughs> Hopefully soon I'll be brewing again. Poor son of a bitch. Brain Damage was directed by Frank Henenlotter and he did Basket Case and Frankenhooker, which we covered. And we will be covering Basket Case very soon. <laughs> it's on the list. It's on the short list. Rick Hurst is in this, just to mention the main character. And he was in like tons of soap operas. Mm -hmm. He's one of those guys that went from B-movie to soap operas. <laughs> yeah. Brain damage starts off with this woman coming home, plops all these brains on the table <laughs> that she got from the butcher. Like, oh, that's kind of small. I don't know if that'll be enough. They go to bring these brains into the bathroom to feed it to something. We don't know what it is. There's nothing in the bathtub. This old couple just lose their <laughs> shit. They just start freaking out. Yeah. Tearing the place apart looking for whatever this thing is that they went to feed. Sounds like that time we went to that party and he couldn't find that bottle opener. Yeah! Where is it? Where is it? Where is it? Then it shows these old people all convulsing and foaming at the mouth. You get introduced to our main character, Brian, here, who's sleeping in a shitty apartment. And he wakes up and kind of rubs the back of his neck and realizes he's bleeding for some reason. It starts, like, hallucinating and, like, there's all this water coming into yeah. his bedroom. All and... this blue liquid yeah. and shit. And... He goes back to the bathroom and doesn't know what's going on. And this creature thing <laughs> kind of pops up from behind his back <laughs> and starts talking to him. <laughs> all pleasant. <laughs> Dude. Convincing Brian to go out with him for the night and find some brains, yeah. basically. <laughs> Victims. Yeah, if you want to keep feeling good, Brian, <laughs> me and you are going to go for a little stroll. <laughs> okay, just put me on the back of your neck. <laughs> well, he puts him on the back of his neck and you see this weird antenna thing like go through into his brain and start squirting all this blue liquid shit on his brain. Yeah, y'all see the brain yeah. too and everything? <laughs> he goes to this junkyard and he's seeing all these weird colors and everything. He's having quite the trip. Yeah. <laughs> Security guard comes out. What are you guys doing here? Jumps off of Brian right into the security guard's head and burrows <laughs> into the guy's brain. <laughs> he's all... Yeah! <laughs> 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 The next day, Brian goes on a date with his gal. Not so nice restaurant. <laughs> Eating this spaghetti and he's trying to concentrate on the conversation with his girlfriend, but he looks down at the spaghetti and starts seeing like, instead of meatballs, all these brains, <laughs> these mini brains that start pulsing. Yeah. <laughs> and burr, burr, burr. Freaks out, he can't hack and he takes off and goes for a walk and ends up at this punk bar where they're playing that wicked song and everything on stage. Some woman notices him and goes up to him and he's like, oh, you're beautiful. Because he's hallucinating, yeah. right? <laughs> so they start dancing and he's some idiot. <laughs> <laughs> She takes him outside and they start kind of kissing a bit. And he's still all hallucinating and don't OD on me yet. Yeah. <laughs> Just kind of trying to keep him awake. She goes down on him. Feels like he got a monster down there. Because <laughs> <laughs> he does. He <laughs> doesn't know how right she is. Unzips his pants and shoots out into her <laughs> mouth and starts eating her brains and it, like, <laughs> it looks like she's giving him a blowjob. <laughs> I don't know how they got away with that, with the sensors. He's all veiny and Yeah, everything. yeah. Brian kind of comes to, notices that his clothes are all full of blood. So he goes back to the apartments and as he's throwing everything in the garbage, there's the old couple that show up and they got a gun. And of course it's some old World, World War II, II like Nazi gun. <laughs> yeah. They want 
Elmer, and he's like, Elmer? He's like, you named the fucking thing Elmer? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> it's, like, it's like, not Elmer. 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 Yeah. Whatever. <laughs> the old man proceeds to tell him the backstory of this organism. This Aylmer has quite a bit of influence <laughs> like over, on our history. Yeah, yeah, over world events. There's a big fight that ensues, and they try and grab Elmer, and Elmer actually ends up killing the old couple. Brian, at this point, is kind of getting fed up with all the killing, so he goes to this, like, flop boarding house with all these shitty people yeah. and, like, the shitty rooms and stuff to try and detox and get away from Elmer. The two kind of get pitted against each other where they're kind of taunting each other and Elmer's taunting him. In the sink? Yeah, yeah, he's like, I can make you feel good. You want my juice, Brian. And that's where we're gonna end the plot. So if you wanna see what happens with Brian and Elmer and all the other ensuing characters in this story, keep watching 1988's Brain Damage. Brain Damage? is a pretty awesome fucking movie. <laughs> yeah. For a B-horror movie that's schlocky as hell, it has a lot to say about a lot of things. Yeah. The subject right. matter in this movie is pretty in your face and intense. Frank Henenlotter had something to say about drug abuse, obviously, with this movie. Whole journey of like a drug addict, right? From getting addicted to then needing it and doing whatever it takes to also destroying and killing everything you every love yeah exactly yeah. and sort of coming full circle and then sort of realizing it too yeah. right elmer is quite the interesting device here as far as what he represents the first thing i got well he's a drug dealer he yeah. represents the dealer the pusher man and he is the drug too right? yeah so. and he's you know i'll make you feel better brian and just, <laughs> you know you want it and you know always convincing him to keep taking it mm -hmm. and i thought it was pretty funny that elmer looks like a piece of shit <laughs> yeah and is that like commentary like drug dealers are a piece of shit and elmer also doesn't only look like a piece of shit he looks pretty phallic too the whole blowjob yeah, scene yeah. is pretty blatant about what it's doing there right yeah and his <laughs> juice yeah and, you know my juice <laughs> so yeah. it's like not only addiction to drugs but addiction to like sex pretty interesting movie in that respect it's saying a lot it covers a full range yeah you're not quite sure if elmer is real or not though Right, because they do such a good job of making this movie like a dream, almost. Yeah, because the atmosphere is so dreamy and like yeah. the colors are always weird blues and purples. Like it never really feels like it takes place in the real world. Yeah, and so you know that Elmer's a metaphor, right? Yeah. So you're always kind of wondering, well, is does Elmer really exist here, or is it, you know, is he just taking a drug of some other kind, the thing on his back, you yeah. know, the addiction, you know, the mm -hmm. thing on your back. And the way the movie is structured and played out is pretty brilliant. Like that opening scene where the old couple's freaking out. Not only is it entertaining as hell, it also builds mystery because you don't know what the hell they're looking for. <laughs> Why are they so upset? Yeah, and then like when Brian wakes up and he's bleeding, like you still don't know what's going on. Like you're not even introduced to this Elmer parasite thing for almost 20 minutes into the movie mm -hmm. where you actually clue it in, oh, that's what they're looking for. Then it's like, well, what is it? Like, what the, where did it come from? And then that kind of plays out for a bit. And then the old man comes out and tells the, the story, right? So, yeah. okay, now I know what this thing is. And it's structured almost perfectly. It's, you know, it's structured it's, perfectly. And the way they kind of unveil things is, is paced really well. And the characters are awesome in this, and there's not that many, which is perfect because it allows you to stay on on point. Yeah, you don't get bogged down with too many characters. It allows the message to get across a lot easier. Focus more on what's really happening. Can't mention the characters without the acting. Like, come on. For a stupid movie like this with this <laughs> stupid alien thing on your back, <laughs> yeah. eating brains, the acting is superb. Rick Hurst, who plays Brian, is fantastic. Being strung out and dealing with this thing on his back. And oh, there's a lot of scenes where it's just him. Mm -hmm. And he's losing his shit. <laughs> yeah. And you believe him. And all the secondary characters are great, too. Like, they're all yeah. over the top and fun. Like, that old couple are just... 
<laughs> crazy. Crazy and fun. <laughs> the effects for this movie, for a low budget kind of movie for what it is, oh, are really, yeah, they're awesome. Oh. How Elmer kills for one thing, you know, and he like bores into people's heads. Yeah. Scene where he's like freaking out and his brains are all coming out, spilling out, and he's all, oh! <laughs> it's like it keeps going. Yeah. Like, and then he's but, like, before that, he's pulling out like his brains, like yeah. a string. <laughs> yeah. It looks great. Elmer himself, man, like mm -hmm. talk about good practical combination of stop motion and puppetry. Looks fantastic, like CGI can't beat that. This movie may be a low budget B movie, but no CGI will ever beat shooting this thing that looks like a piece of shit <laughs> yeah. shaped like a dick <laughs> in real life. The music for this movie is uh, a little odd. There's parts where it sounds like a kind of a shitty full moon movie, but then there's other parts where it's just awesome. And I think overall, both sort of parts of the music just fit the movie perfectly. Even the parts of the movie where the music is that kind of generic shitty, I can tell you exactly what patch on what <laughs> synthesizer they are using. <laughs> it's the digital native dance on a fucking D50. <laughs> that they use in every shitty BR movie. It suits the style of the movie, yeah. right? It suits even the, the shitty music suits it because, ah, oh, it's a B movie, of course it sounds like that. But then when the movie gets good, the music gets good too. Like a Tangerine Dream style sort score. Of. It's like, oh man, this music kicks ass. It also plays with the comedy of the movie too because music is sort of shitty at the funnier parts too. It ramps up where it needs. And when it gets serious, the music gets better. Mm -hmm. The settings in this movie are fantastic because it really reflects mm -hmm. the whole drug use drug addiction going down this rabbit hole. Every setting is like dirty and grungy. Their apartment's kind of shitty. Even when he takes his girlfriend to that date, that place doesn't look all that good. Looks like, ugh, oh, that place yeah. looks shitty. As he's going downhill with his addiction to Elmer, the settings get more grungy That's and right. shitty, yeah. right? It's just perfect. And then the punk bar. Exactly, yeah. It's just so good. Like. There's not one nice setting in this. And that's how it's supposed to be because drug addiction is not nice. Yeah. <laughs> that's yeah. exactly what it is. The settings reflect what the character is going through, right? His descent into fucking madness and uh, addiction. This cheesy 80s B movie nails so many of these essential things to do in a movie. Mm -hmm. Like using the setting to reflect what the character is going through, all this stuff when these big budget blockbuster Hollywood movies have no fucking clue. Yeah, they, they, they can't accomplish half of what this movie did. Like a tenth of the budget. <laughs> yeah. You know? Yeah. It's insane. It's incredible. It just shows you what vision can do. The only negative about this movie really is some scenes seem kind of stretched out too long mm -hmm. and repetitive. Like they keep always showing that same shot of Elmer opening his mouth and putting the thing in his brain and the, the blue shit going in his brain. Like, it's repetitive <laughs> in that way. Then I did some digging and to find out the first cut of this movie was like just over an hour. Yeah. And they needed to like, okay, this has got to be a f hour and a half feature length. We've got to fill some time. So now, okay, I get it why they had to like stretch out some scenes, maybe make them longer than they should have been. Yeah. And start repeating other shots, reusing old shots to just stretch out the runtime. But it doesn't hurt the movie enough to make it bad. Not it's just not like, yeah, I've seen that shot two or three times already. I don't need to see it again. Check out 1988's Brain Damage. It is a trip in every sense of the word, yeah. you know? Yeah. <laughs> and until next time, keep drinking.